Hello everyone. Welcome to the seventh lecture of the fifth module, which is on combinational circuit design. So far, we looked at different ways of designing combinational circuits. <clears throat> we started our discussion with the static CMOS design. Then to reduce the transistor count, we looked at the prospects of pseudo NMOS logic. We also looked at, you know, pass transistor logic, transmission gate based logic. We looked at their advantages, disadvantages, and so on. There's another class of logic design, which is known as dynamic design. So, so far, whatever we discussed, it was kind of a static design. Now, what we will be discussing is called the dynamic design. And in dynamic design, what is so special about it? So what special about it is that the logic levels are stored as charges on a floating node, right? So that is special about it. And since the charges are being stored in a floating node, there would be several leakage mechanisms. And therefore, you need to do periodic refresh or you need to you know, periodically uh, refresh those charges so as to combat you know, problems such as charge leakage, charge sharing, and so on. So in this lecture, we would be looking into detail of this dynamic logic design. So this dynamic logic design is specifically used when you know, your circuit is switching so, too much. When you know, the probability of circuit being in, or the inputs being in a static state is quite small, and you find that you know, the inputs are switching significantly, then dynamic logic is a better choice. So the disclaimers remain the same even for this lecture. And let us look at the dynamic CMOS design in detail. So static CMOS design, we saw that you know for n inputs, this design required two n MOSFETs for realization. So to reduce the transistor count, we moved ahead to pseudo n MOS logic where we required n plus one MOSFETs for n fan ins or n inputs. But we saw that because of that unconditional load, there was a static power dissipation. So we also proposed, you know, ways to uh, kind of increase that, uh, what, should, what should I say, ways to, you know, uh, reduce that power, static power dissipation as well. And also we looked at different other ways like pass transistor logic, transmission gate logic. However, the problem with pass transistor transmission gate logic, so not transmission gate logic, the pass transistor logic was rail to rail swing was not available, right? And cascading and all was also a problem and non-regenerative even transmission gate is non-regenerative. Although, you know, you do away with the uh, rail to rail swing. I mean, you realize the rail to rail swing in transmission gate, but again, the problem is what problem is that you add one more input, which is your control input. And hence the routing becomes complex and also increase the capacitances, right? As compared to the past one system. And also they are not regenerative. Only the static CMOS is regenerative. So you'll always suffer from, you know, short circuit leakage and uh, also your you know, delay will increase and you won't be able to, you know, get perfect or close to step inputs or close to step outputs out of those circuits. So now let us talk about dynamic CMOS design. So in dynamic CMOS design, it also, you reduce the MOSFET count to, to, to N plus two as compared to two N MOSFETs of static CMOS design. I am writing that it doesn't offer you a static participation, but that has to be taken with a pinch of salt. Why a pinch of salt? Because if subthreshold leakage is considered, there would be some static participation. But there, that would only be a leakage participation. I mean, that would only be because of subthreshold leakage. Apart from that, there is no connection between the VDT and the ground rates, right? In the dynamic CMOS design as well. And if you look at its pull down network, it's same as static CMOS. So in pseudo NMOS also, the pull down network was same as static CMOS. And same goes for dynamic CMOS design as well. So if you look at the structure of the dynamic CMOS design, you have this floating node output. Then you have this which is kind of connected to the supply via this P MOSFET, which is fed by clock. Then you have the pull down network and then you have evaluation transistor. So this is called pre-charge transistor and this is called evaluation transistor. And here you have the pull down network, which is same as the static CMOS. And this output here, note that this output here is floating. I mean, uh, it's floating at one point of time or it can be floating during evaluation phase. It's not floating during pre-charge phase, but it can be floating during the evaluation phase. So let us look into the details of this dynamic CMOS design. So if you look at this output, this output is one when clock bar is equals to one or when this PDN that is G is equals to one and clock is equals to one. So the logic functions, the logic function which would be realized here is clock bar plus G bar, okay? So this is the logic function that you can realize at this <clears throat> output. So everything is same. I mean, when you have to design a dynamic CMOS design, then also you will design the pull down network such that F bar is equals to G and that's it. That's it. That will work fine. 
So other part about this is it has to be synchronized with a clock. Why it has to be synchronized with a clock? Because you know this node is floating and the charges over here would determine the logic levels. So these charges can leak or these charges can be shared with any other wire. I mean, there can be crosstalk, there can be, you know, some other parasitic capacitances which are connected to this node, which will kind of, you know, lead to charge sharing mechanism. So to reduce that, I mean, to reduce or to sustain this charge, or I would say uh, to stop the movement, to stop the movement, or not stop the movement, actually to sustain the charges over here, we need a periodic refresh, refreshing of the charge at this node. And for that, we need to synchronize it with a clock. So here the clock is also an input. So you can see that the clock is input. So, you know, number of inputs has increased. Routing here also will be complex. Now, in this kind of design, in dynamic CMOS design, you have a sequence of pre-charge and evaluation phases. So what happens in pre-charge? What happens in evaluation? Let us see that. So when clock is equals to zero, that is known as pre-charge phase. So let us look at when clock is zero, what happens? So when clock is zero, this P MOSFET is turned on and this floating node over here gets charged to VDD. So once it gets charged to VDD, it's no longer floating. It is connected via low impedance to the supply, right? So in the pre-charge phase, what happens? No matter whatever logic is in the pull-down network, this will be charged to VDD, right? Because this evaluation transistor, when clock is zero, this doesn't turn on and it does not provide any path for this output to discharge. I mean, obviously there would be some subthreshold leakage of this transistor as well as the pull-down network. But even if the inputs are such that G is equals to one, this won't discharge because of this evaluation transistor. So this evaluation transistor is important for functionality, right? Now let us see what happens in the, so uh, that is what I told you, evaluation is necessary for functionality. However, in the pull-down, like what happens when you want this to discharge, then this evaluation transistor comes in series with, you know, the overall pull-down network. So effectively, the driving strength of the pull-down network is reduced because you have a resistance in series, right? Even if this MOSFET is turned on, it will offer some resistance and that is in series. So effectively, the driving strength would be reduced of the pull-down network because of this evaluation effect. But it is necessary for what? It is necessary for functionality. Why functionality? Because even if pull-down network is on, then the output doesn't get discharged in the pre-charge phase. And that is what makes this evaluation effect very important. Now, what happens in evaluation phase? In pre-charge phase, we saw that clock is equal to zero. This output gets charged to VDD. And does that depend upon the size of this PMOS? No. So it's also ratio-less, just like static CMOS. So the voltage over here doesn't depend upon the size of this PMOS because regardless of the size of PMOS, this will kind of get charged to VDD. If you give it enough time, I mean, if the clock frequency is small enough, this will get charged to VDD always. I mean, depending upon the capacitor, load capacitor that is here and so on. So in uh, so what happens in evaluation phases, the clock gets one. And once the clock is one, then what happens depending upon the pull down network, this node may or may not be discharged to ground. So if it gets discharged to ground, fine, you obtain a logic level zero. And through a low impedance, it is connected to the ground. But if the inputs are such that this pull down network is not connected or it's not on, and this F is not discharged to ground, then this output is floating, right? Then this is at high impedance. And that is why we name it a dynamic design because then the output is having some charge and output is actually having like the output load capacitor is having some charge. And depending upon the state or the charge on the load capacitor, we call or we take a decision on what logic has been implemented. So this node is floating and that is why the name dynamic signals. Let us look at some other specific traits of this. I mean, the advantages I would say. So first, once output is discharged, it cannot be charged unless you go for pre-charge phase. So if that is the case, you can only have one transition in the evaluation phase, right? So if one transition is allowed in the evaluation phase, your dynamic hazard or glitches, they are altogether removed. So you see how good this is in terms of your removal of dynamic hazard or glitches. Because in evaluation phase, you can only go once from logic level high to logic level. Only if your inputs are such that, you know, your pull down network is on, then only your output will be discharged. Otherwise it will remain at, you know, it will remain floating and it will contain that charge unless there's some charge sharing or, you know, charge leakage, but it will contain some charge. 
So unless and once you know once that node has been discharged to the ground, unless you turn on your P MOSFET in the pre-charge phase, it cannot be charged to one again. So only one transition is allowed. No dynamic hazard, no glitches. Your life becomes easy as a design. Output is in the high impedance state of floating that I discussed already. Also, it's a non-ratioed logic because the size of P MOSFET does not dictate the logic levels, right? No matter how large or how small you make this PMOS, I mean the delay will be affected, but it won't affect you know uh, the functionality. Also, in this kind of circuit, the dynamic power is just, uh, like <clears throat> dynamic. <power. coughs> also, in this kind of circuit, the dynamic power dissipation dominates <clears throat> because you know you are continuously uh, moving the circuit from pre-charge phase to evaluation phase and so on. I mean you're you are constantly clocking the circuit. And the clock is transitioning between pre-charge phase and evaluation phase. And as such, your dynamic power dissipation will be high. However, because you have less number of capacitance, less number of transistors, so you have low capacitance, as well as because only one input is driving one MOSFET. So the logical effort of the gate is also reduced, right? The input capacitance, which the gate is seeing, has also reduced. Also, it is faster. Why it is faster? Because, you know, the load capacitances have reduced and logical effort has also reduced. So delay would be smaller, right? That is a direct consequence of these two factors. You can reduce this, you can reduce this, uh, you know, uh, this delay further by increasing the size of P MOSFET, right? You increase the size of P MOSFET, your TPLH reduces. However, if you are increasing the size of this P MOSFET, what is happening is your input capacitance of the P MOSFET is also increasing. And now your clock is feeding that P MOSFET as well as the M MOSFET. That is the evaluation MOSFET, right? So if the clock is feeding large MOSFET, then the load that the clock has to drive, that actually increases, right? So it may be difficult for the clock to even drive all such, you know, if you have a chain of such gates, then you have to drive all such P MOSFETs together, right? So it just increases the load on that clock. Also, since there is no path between, you know, VAD and ground, so there's no short circuit power dissipation and you obtain a full logic swing here. So these are also advantages. Now, one thing is that, you know, we, we define something called gate switching threshold VM or, you know, noise margins. Noise margins are static quantities, but here in this dynamic design, since you're periodically refreshing, you're periodically driving this circuit into pre-charge mode and evaluation mode, and you're performing computations only in the evaluation mode. So what is happening is it's not working in the static mode, right? You're dynamically changing the, you know, uh, you have some time dependence. You are dynamically changing the oper operation of this gate. So in such a scenario, your noise margin and VM, which are static quantities, you cannot perform static analysis to analyze these things or, you know, static analysis won't be suitable for this kind of logic where it has got time dependence and you are, you know, continuously changing the mode of operation from pre-charge to evaluation and so on. So the static analysis is not suitable for dynamic logic and noise margin and VM they are something, I mean, which is, which should not be defined ideally, but in order to compare the different designs, we can define it, but in a different way. So how can we define VM or VIH or VIL for this kind of circuit? So you know that, you know, the moment the inputs become more than VTH, those N MOSFETs in the pull down network, they'll discharge it, right? So the moment the inputs become more than VTH, you can assume that the output is discharged. So because of that, it is a safe assumption to say that the VIH is equals to VIL is equals to VT of N. That is the threshold voltage of all the N MOSFETs. If it is VTN, then you can directly see that one consequence of that is that noise margin low is actually smaller, right? Also, what I'm saying is here, logic level low also depends on evaluation time. I mean, see, there's a capacitor which is discharging via these N MOSFETs. So these N MOSFETs can only supply a limited, or these N MOSFETs can only sink a limited amount of current. So the charge that you can drain out of those capacitors is actually proportional to the current that can be sunk into the time period or into the time which you are giving for evaluation phase. I mean, if your clock is too fast, it will again pre-charge and you know, you may not be able to, you know, uh, discharge it all the way to the ground. So that is why I'm saying, so the clock frequency has to be appropriate. Highest clock frequency will be determined by you know, uh, the time it takes to discharge that capacitor to the ground and lowest clock frequency will be determined by the periodic refresh thing. I mean, how fast the charges are being leaked out of that capacitor 
and you have to uh, refresh that. So the lower bound is actually dependent upon how fast is your charge leakage and so on. So what we discussed there was uh, like uh, entry. So in the previous slide, what I showed you was an entry dynamic logic where, you know, pull down network is there and the output is connected to this P MOSFET. So pre-charge is being done by connecting output to this P MOSFET. There's another class of this, which is called P tree dynamic logic. So which is shown here. So here, what is happening? It's pull up network. Sorry. So it's a pull up network, which is, it's a pull up network here, which is made up of P MOSFETs. And here the output is connected close to this FET over here. Here, this is known as pre-charge MOSFET, and this is known as evaluation MOSFET. So here the logic is realized as the pull up network. Initially in the pre-charge phase here, what happens? This pre-charge MOSFET drains this output to the ground and this gets charged to the VDD only once, you know, your pull up network is one. And here also evaluation fit is necessary for uh, functionality. So this is what happens in a P tree. So you have P tree and entry. They are complement of each other. They are duals of each other. Here also the functionality is like F is equals to H into clock bar, right? There it was, there was, uh, there it was G bar plus something, but here it is clock bar into H. Because you know the pull down network realizes the complement of this, but the pull up network realizes same output as F. So hence this is H. Now, so far we have discussed about you know the advantages of the dynamic CMOS design. Now let us look at the issues, right? Because the grass always looks greener on the other side. Let us look at the first side of it. I mean, so first thing, since the clock is driving all such you know network of dynamic CMOS design. So the clock power dissipation is large. Why? Because it has to continuously charge and discharge those pre-charge and the evaluation phase MOSFETs. So first, clock power dissipation is large. Second, it may not be possible to you know even uh, drive such loads, drive all such loads. Also, the number of MOSFETs is still larger than pseudo and MOS designed by one, but that is a minor disadvantage. Major disadvantage is it has got a higher switching activity. We told that dynamic power dissipation is dominant, but load capacitances are pretty small. Correct. But dynamic power dissipation depends upon switching activity and then load capacitance and VDD, right? Here, switching activity is higher. Why it is higher? First, because we are periodically pre-charging and evaluation, like we are periodically doing this pre-charge and evaluation. Also, how do we define the alpha zero to one for this? So alpha zero to one of the output here is defined as probability that the output is zero. Why so? Because unless you drain the output to zero, it won't be pre-charged, right? So only if the output is zero, then it will require pre-charging or then the capacitor will be pre-charged from zero to one. If the output is not drained to zero, then the output will remain at one, even in the pre-charge phase, and it won't take any power from the supply. So in the case of dynamic CMOS design, it takes power from the supply only in the next pre-charge cycle, once the output is zero during evaluation phase, right? So once the output is zero during evaluation phase, in the next pre-charge cycle, it will take some power from the supply. Therefore, alpha zero to one here is P zero, which is the probability that the output is zero. And you know that product of probabilities, since probabilities are fractional numbers, so P zero is always greater than or equal to P zero times P one. So you see that the switching activity has increased, but CL is lower. So dynamic power dissipation is also not that significant. I mean, it dominates here because there's no static power dissipation as such. I mean, there would be some, but that is not dominant. It's the dynamic power dissipation, which is dominant over here. But the major problem with this kind of uh, design is first charge leakage issue. So the charge at the load capacitor, it leaks even though PDN is off. I mean, I told that, you know, the logic levels are embedded in terms of the charges on this floating node or the high impedance node. However, there are several mechanisms by which these charges may leak. And if these charges leak, then, you know, you'll read a different state. You can read even a logic level zero. So that is one of the problem with this kind of circuit. So what are different modes of charge leakage? So this is your output. These are the different modes of charge leakage. So first is the diode leakage component. So there are two diodes, one between the drain and the body of this P MOSFET, one between the drain and the body of this N MOSFET, right? However, if you look at it, this is trying to, this leakage current is trying to charge it. This is trying to discharge it. So they are counteracting, right? And also there would be the subthreshold leakage of this P MOSFET as well as N MOSFET. So the subthreshold leakage of P MOSFET is trying to charge this node while the subthreshold leakage of N MOSFET is trying to discharge this node. 
so you know you you already have this kind of a counteract or i would say a compensation mechanism here so one is trying to charge it one is trying to discharge it right so effectively the amount of charge leakage depends upon the strength of charging versus the strength of discharge so this is the case over here and now the minimum clock period is basically determined by these leakage currents so there is this charge over here which is getting like you know which is being lost by these mechanisms so the amount of charge being lost or the time in which all the all of this charge will be lost is simply defined by q by i leakage right so there has to be a minimum clock frequency which will kind of you know uh, refresh this or you will regain the amount of charge after a certain period of time so that the output logic level is still read as logic level high so that is the main motto of recharge or refreshing so during refresh in the precharge cycle what you do is or the minimum clock cycle or minimum clock frequency should be such that amount of charge being lost from here is still read as logic level 1 let's say that you know your vm is equals to vt vm is equals to vt for this kind of circuit so the moment the, let's say we initially precharge it to vdd but because of these leakages it has after time t it has become vt so that t after which this becomes vt will become the clock period and that has to be the maximum clock period for refreshing right and that maximum clock period for refreshing will translate to minimum clock period for uh, this uh, dynamic circuit design and also i already told that leakage for n mosfets generally compensates for p mosfets so <coughs> the other way to mitigate that is by connecting a bleeder transistor over here so this is similar to you know that uh, pass transistor logic level restorer so what you do is you connect another p mosfet over here and then you ground its kit so what happens this is pulled all the way from so this is always pulled to vd like this is always pulled to vd right this is what happens so this bleeder transistor can be used to compensate for leakage and you know here the problem is if you use only this bleeder transistor then you have to do proper sizing so so uh, when you have to do proper sizing what that means is the bleeder transistor bleeder resistance should be high that is you not only need to charge this to vdd i mean you not only need to keep this charge so that the voltage here is vdd but when the inputs are appropriate and the clock is one you also want to discharge this node all the way to the ground so if you want to discharge this node all the way to the ground then you also want that you know this pull down network should be strong enough to pull this towards the ground and then you require for that is that the bleeder resistance should be high or the size of this bleeder should be as small as possible but again since it is unconditional so you'll have static power dissipation as well right once the pull down network is on then this is also on so you have some path from vdd to the ground and you have static power dissipation so to remove static power dissipation you can use this feedback loop similar to the logic restore right now there is another problem which is also prominent which is basically related to charge sharing and capacitive coupling so what happens exactly in this circuit is the charge on the load capacitor here even if this you know pull down network is not on this charge is actually shared between the capacitances at the internal nodes let's say b is equals to 0 the pull down network is not on but if a is equals to 1 the charge over here will definitely be so these two capacitances are connected by a small resistance and there will be some charge sharing right and because of the charge sharing which is actually proportional to you know the sizes of these capacitances or the amount of capacitances what happens some charge over here gets transferred to this point right and when that happens what exactly happens there is a reduction in the charge over here or there is a reduction in the voltage over here. so this kind of charge sharing also leads to some loss of or some change in the uh, output voltage value at this load or, or at this output node what is the worst case so the worst case is that if you have such long pull down network so only the last one is equals to zero all the others are equal to one so this will be you know uh, this load capacitor will be connected to all of these internal load capacitors apart from the last one right so that is the worst case scenario what it will do it will definitely reduce the output voltage level and if it is reduced below vt then what happens it leads to incorrect operation right one of the ways to mitigate it can be you know 
that you pre-charge the internal nodes. So if your internal nodes are already pre-charged to VDD, so there would be no charge sharing because this node is already at VDD, this node is already at VDD. So there won't be any charge sharing, there won't be any current flowing between the two, right? So that is one way of mitigating it. Also, since this is output node, since this output node is floating, if there's a neighboring wire, you can understand that the crosstalk would be large, right? And that crosstalk can also, you know, change the amount of, uh, like it can also influence the amount of voltage on this node. Case when this dynamic CMOS is actually, when dynamic is actually driving the static CMOS, when the input makes a transition from zero to one, what may happen is once the input is going from zero to one, this out to over here, this will go from one to zero, right? Because the input goes from zero to one, this will be off and this will go from zero. This will go from one to zero. If this is going from one to zero, it may be coupled to this node, right? It is coupled to this node by a, what? Via this parasitic capacitance, which over here is your, <clears throat> your CGD, right? Since this is coupled to this node as well via this parasitic capacitance, it can definitely hamper, you know, or it can definitely disturb the charge at this floating node, right? So that is one of the issues. <clears throat> Also, there's something which is known as clock feed through, which is a special case of capacitive coupling. So in your dynamic CMOS design, what happens is the in the pre-charge phase, the clock goes from zero to one, right? Let's say this node is floating and this clock is going from zero to one. So this P MOSFET here, there would be a CGD, right? And this CGD would directly couple this clock to this output. And for a moment, the output voltage will overshoot from VDD and then what would happen? This output voltage would be greater than VDD. So because of that overshoot, what may happen is this body, this body terminal may get forward bias, right? And once these get forward bias, so it leads to all sorts of problems. It can also lead to, you know, your CMOS latching. Anyway, so that's another problem of this kind of design. Now, can we cascade dynamic logic? Or what are the possibilities or what are the issues while cascading the dynamic logic, right? So in dynamic logic, you know that in the pre-charge phase, all of the, uh, like all of the dynamic logic trees are fed by a clock. When the clock is zero, the output of all of those networks or all of those outputs goes to VDD, right? They are pre-charged to VDD via the PMOS. Now, if it is cascaded, that output is actually fed to the input of the next stage, right? So if it is fed to the input of the next stage during the pre-charge phase, that becomes one. So if that is one, then what may happen is immediately after the pre-charge phase, if that is a critical path, if that input forms a part of the critical path, then that will immediately discharge the output of the next stage. This will become very clear once we discuss this example. So let us take the example of this two stage inverter using dynamic CMOS design. What we should ensure is that the input should transition only once during the evaluation phase. Now let us look at this circuit. What happens here is that, you know, the moment the input goes from, so let's say during pre-charge, you have made output one as well as output two as VDD, right? When the clock is zero, output one is also VDD, output two is also VDD. Now the moment, you know, that you start the pre-charge phase or you start the evaluation phase, that is you make clock equals to one. Even if the input is one, only if this node gets discharged to VTN, will this output stop discharging. So let me put it the other way. During the pre-charge, what happens? Clock is zero. So out one is also one, out two is also one. Now in the evaluation phase, the moment clock is equals to one, since this is one, it will start discharging, right? The output two will start discharging, even though input is one. Because even if input is one, this out one will be discharged to VTN so that this gets cut off only after some time, right? Because it will take some time to discharge this capacitance to VTN voltage. Only after that, out two won't be discharged. So in this kind of cascading, the voltages here are disturbed. Voltages of the next stage are disturbed. And you know, it's not even regenerative. So if the voltages are disturbed, so it gets propagated along the network. And as such, you may end up having an incorrect logic level. So the only thing is, since it is being fed as input to the next stage, and if it is the critical path, I mean, if it, if it is the input determining the output of the next stage, then even if the input here is one, it will take some time to discharge it to voltage VTN, which will lead to cutoff of this device. Until that time, this output two will discharge. So the output logic level that you'll get is incorrect. It may be incorrect. I mean, here, 
Uh, it depends upon all sorts of things like driving strength and so on, but you may get an incorrect logic level. So what we should ensure always is that the input should make only one transition during the evaluation phase. Here it would be two transitions, right? Here it would be, this would make only one transition, but here it will discharge and then again it will remain fixed. So that is actually two transitions, so as to say. So to remove this and to enable cascading of this dynamic logic, what people uh, invented was this domino logic. So what is domino logic? Domino logic is nothing but a dynamic logic plus an inverter. So they just use a dynamic logic, put an inverter here, and then that enables cascading. Why? Because since an inverter is here, so the input doesn't go to one, right? The input is zero in the pre-charge phase. So that is an advantage here. So the way the domino logic is connected is this. You can cascade domino logic like this. You have uh, entry, entry of dynamic logic, then you have inverter, then you connect it to the next stage and so on, right? Now, the best part about this is that the fan out is being driven by static CMOS. Since the fan out is being driven by static CMOS, it will first give you a low impedance or it will always connect the output node to VDD or ground via low impedance path. And also it will be regenerated. So whatever loss you may get in the process, it will be recovered since the process, since these gates are regenerated. Also, here you can connect a bleeder MOSFET, right? So you can use this inverter and you just have to connect a bleeder MOSFET and then you realize VTD, you like combat the charge leakage issues as well as charge redistribution issues when you use that bleeder MOSFET. So that is also an advantage of using this domino. This advantage, you can only realize non-inverting logic. So if you can realize only non-inverting logic, pure domino realization of logics are rare. I mean, people use all sorts of tricks. They use De Morgan's law and try to convert everything as, you know, uh, as many parts of logic as possible by using that uh, Morgan's law, they try to convert it into a non-inverting logic and they implement those using dom uh, Domino and rest they implement using static. I mean, that is also something that people used earlier actually. Now, since we can realize only non-inverting logic with Domino, people came up with this NPC MOS logic. It is also dynamic logic. What it does is it actually exploits the duality of the entry and key tree of dynamic logic that we have discussed earlier. And here it also eliminates the need of inverters while cascading. So what people do in NPC MOS design is that you have, this is your, what? This is your entry, this is your P tree, right? So you can directly connect entry output as an input of P tree network. That is the best advantage of it, right? And if you want to connect the output of this entry network to another entry network, you just have to use an inverter. Similarly, if you have to connect output of this P-tree network to another P-tree network, you just have to use an inverter. So this basically exploits the duality of the clock. So entry is controlled by clock. I mean, entry evaluation is controlled by clock. P-tree is evaluation is controlled by its complement. Since both are happening in different stages, I mean, clock and clock bar are exclusive. So those two are kind of independent. So an entry can directly drive a P-tree. That's the advantage. However, this circuit also, I mean, if you are using just entry driving a P-tree, then it is non-regenerative. And also P-trees are generally slow. Why? Because P-MOSFETs have a lower mobility. So if you want to, you know, equalize, or if you want to match the speed with entry, you have to increase the size of this P-tree. So NP logic has this disadvantage that it's non-regenerative and the P-tree is actually slow and you have to use a large area or you have to like invest more on area if you might, if you want to match the speed or if you want to uh, equalize the deal. So we read about all such logic designs. I mean, we read about a lot of logic designs. Now the question at hand is, which design methodology should we choose? So this is the problem at hand of a designer. So as a designer, we know about all such logics. I mean, we know about static CMOS, we know about pseudo NMOS, we know about pass transistor, transmission gate, we know about dynamic logic now. Which should we choose? Suppose someone gives us a design problem. So suppose someone wants us to realize a NOR gate. Let's say three inputs OR gate as I asked you to realize in the exam. What should we do? What is the most efficient way of realizing? It? So the answer doesn't depend upon what is the most efficient way of realizing. It. The answer depends upon what is the constraint that the you know consumer has given. Even for the industries, they'll just give you like different consumers like Apple. So if Apple is going to buy a processor from let's say Qualcomm, it will just say that you know I want more reliability because reliability is something which is you know the USP of Apple. <clears throat> Similarly, 
other companies like samsung they'll go more on performance these chinese companies they'll go more on the cost that is the area so different different companies or different consumers will come up with different constraints and as a designer we have to fulfill these constraints and our design methodology should take into account these constraints itself right so what are these constraints so first is ease of design can we automate it second is area or cost third is speed fourth is power then noise margin robustness to noise immunity and all such things are also there so we looked at static cmos design and we found that it's robust to noise this is design is simple however it was expensive in area and power but the simple design enables you to you know go for automation and nowadays everything is automated and i don't know if you recently looked at uh, the article in the forbes magazine so this nvidia apple and all those companies they have made a consortium and then they are trying to use ml for designing these chips so in the future you can expect more automation in the chip design as well if you looked at cmos like if you looked at pseudo nmos it was simple and fast but the problem there was the noise margin was reduced and there was static participation so if power is a concern never go for pseudo nmos design <clears throat> dynamic logic we saw that it's fast and small but the problem here is we need a periodic refresh and periodic refresh also leads to you know energy dissipation it not only puts a lower bound on the frequency of the clock but it also puts you know a constraint on the energy dissipation because every time you refresh it you are pulling some charges from the vdd and dropping it or uh, shifting it to the load capacitor so this periodic refresh is also a problem there in recent times it's the static cmos which is generally preferred why because of this level of automation which we need now in the digital industry so you see all such things are like you know not such important not so important it's the ease of design which people are now now preferring because level of automation is also something that is important industries they always require to cut on the cost how can they cut on the cost if they can reduce the manpower how can they reduce the manpower if they can go for large levels of automation in design however it, i won't say that it is leading to loss of employment because now cad design like cad companies they are hiring a lot of people so it's you know technology will only lead to employment generation not to unemployment i mean somebody's loss is somebody's gain i mean earlier the designers used to place all this mosfets on their own they used to route all of them they used to size all of them but now the, that is not needed the cad tools automatically take care of that okay so that was all about combinational circuit design from the next lecture we would be looking at the sequential circuit design